This, this is the Forge Audio Network, your official source for all things Forge FC. Great to have you with us, and this is a, a good one to be with us for. I'm RJ Broadhead, joined by the newest member of the Hamilton Sports Group, Steve Melton. You're going to be a multi-platform columnist with Ticats Audio Network, Forge Audio Network. You're going to be website. You're going to be doing a little bit of everything. Tell us how this all came about. Well, I, I, the, the main impetus, I think, RJ, and you and I have talked about this working together again, like we did so many, so much, so often over the years. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's, it came up when I was still uh, working at the, at, the, at the newspaper. Uh, and uh, when that ended for me, I wasn't ready to be done. I'm not going to let somebody else tell me when I'm done. Right. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that sounds like an old player, doesn't it? It, and, it, uh, it does, but that's the right so way the to go. Cats, the Thai Cats had, had shown some cursory interest at one point because they wanted to build up the whole. I would call their their media situation right. It become you know more of a media type type thing, and and to expand it to take the good work that you guys have, and men and women have done in Ticats Audio uh, Network and Forge Audio Network, both of which, by the way, that your viewers may not understand, are radical concepts for the for their time, and it, it is the Absolutely. way of the future. It is the way of the future, and uh, the Tie Cats showed their showed uh, that they were going to. They want to expand that a little more, uh, all platforms, uh, including more on the Forge, and and uh, and enhancing uh, the relationship between the fans, people that care, and people that that only sort of partially care. Um, they want to expand that. Now, in this day and age, I'm just coming out of an industry where I spent half a century. Uh, it, it was contracting and, and continued to contract and continue to tra- contract. And here is a group that is taking basically the same principle, which is the, the it's all in sports, but it is kind of, it's a journalism, it's a type of journalism, and it's expanding it. Who wouldn't want to be part of that? You know, it, exactly opposite of the trend that the world is going, and, 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 uh, and I applaud that. And uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to be part of that. I've obviously and wrote about it uh, in the first column, which appears today, uh, that, that I wanted to be part of, of wherever that goes and, and uh, investing time and resources in, in making the connection between fans and fan, enhancing sports fans' experience. I've spent my whole life, I mean, my whole life, going back to when I was 17 years old, uh, in and around professional sport. So this was a, a great opportunity. Uh, it, it, you want to be part of something new, and this is, it, it, while we're, we are advancing principles that already exist, it is new. It is new, this kind of commitment. I think it'll set the tone for a lot of things in the future. And uh, I, like, I like sort of the, the idea of the Ticats trying new things and having the guts to hi- hire a veteran, and I would say hardcore, journalist. Now, that, <laughs> takes, that takes corporate confidence and takes corporate uh, sort of... Uh, Belief in itself that 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 you can you can handle basically an outsider coming inside. Also, oh, it's an easy hire, Steve. You're a Hall of Famer. You're a Canadian <laughs> Football Hall of Famer. <laughs> you know what that means? It means you outlast everybody. So <laughs> you stick around long enough. <laughs> you stick around long enough, and you become a legend. And you know, as long as you, you know, as, as we said with my 17th century judge's hair here. <laughs> you know, so you know, now that a you're going to be brand uh, with that. Now that you're going to be appearing more, are you going to right. be down the hair dye aisle, or are you going to stick with that? Oh no, I think I'll stick with that. You know, it's yeah. sort of uh, you know. I like it. it. It kind of if you got it flaunted, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, obviously I'm a long-haired guy. I don't think you saw me during the uh, during the uh, pandemic when I had uh, what it looked like the the greatest hits of a '60s band album. You know, like you know, yeah. Retro well, I think you got it cut. With- yeah, I know. Like I would have seen you in 2021 a little bit. That's right. But. Yeah, and and I had it really, really, really long then. But it, you know, I'm an ex-hippie. All right, I grew <laughs> up in the 60s, right? So I'm gonna, I bring that sensibility to to a lot of things in my life, and a lot of it is what what's on top. You know, let's say say you know, snow in the you know, I don't I won't, I won't even use that phrase. You know, snow <laughs> on the roof, fire in the furnace, right? So, so. You, you had to do it. <laughs> I had to do it. Sorry. 
Well, you know, it's interesting you bring up right. uh, how, you know, Ticats Audio Network launched in 2021. Uh, Forge right. Audio Network has been has been fantastic. And I remember having conversations with Matt Affinek and Scott Mitchell. I was the first hire of the Ticats Audio Network, and I'm very proud of that. But when the concept was, was brought to me, it was brand new. There weren't a lot of teams doing their own broadcasts and, and having their own network. And I think the way regional rights have gone in a lot of professional sports, that uh, the Tiger Cats are kind of uh, the front runners in, in that aspect. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more of, of this going forward. And it's, it, it's been great going into the, the fourth year now and covering the team. Can you still be critical of the Tiger Cats or the Forge in this role, Steve, if you have to be? I think as long as it's fair, we've discussed this at length. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think there was wiggle room on that. Now, I do understand a couple of things that I now I'm working for the team. And I think some people might say he can't do that, but, you know, like, it, 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 it's a little bit different than newspapers uh, that way. Uh, and part of it is because of the half century in journalism, I trust myself. I trust my own principles. And, and I won't cross any lines that I can't cross. You know, in, in other, I mean, in, in, from a journalistic standpoint. Um, so uh, there'll be, I'm sure, times when, when stuff is, is, well, there's too much inside stuff and delicate stuff that, that but for the most part, uh, the the theory is be fair, yep. uh, be honest, uh, analyze when it analyzes. Not everything I did at the spec was ripping the Tiger Cats. I mean, it, it definitely <laughs> wasn't that. I mean, there was plenty of opportunity for that for the last couple of years because, let's be honest, it was two years of eight and ten and, and losing playoff games, right? So, they're, I mean, they made the playoffs, which is a great thing. And, and uh, you know, we always try to point that out. But there's a lot of other things as well that go into into reporting and and. And much of that is ferreting out and, t and telling the stories of the people. Storytelling is what I do. Criticism yeah. is part of that storytelling. But storytelling is the larger thing. And that, my understanding, is where we want to progress this, where it's going to evolve. And this is an evolution. It's not a revolution. It's an evolution because of what you people have done already in, in, the, in the audio and what the Ticat Ty Forge websites have done. Uh, in basic reporting. I think we're just going to expand that um, and also amplify it. And that's why it's called a columnist and not a content provider, because columnist implies that there's analysis, that, the, the, that there's criticism which is fair when it, when it, it is merited. And, and I think you'll particularly see that on game day, because, you know, that's when it's hot. You know, that's when, when people, you know, want to know what somebody who's been around it since I've been around the CFL. I think I was at my first game in 1957. Wow. Uh, and, and was that as, a, as I, a fan? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and actually I was at a game that, that it was at varsity stadium for the Argos. And that's how long ago it was. They've played, I think in three or four stadia since then. And, uh, it, the record was set there. That'll never be broken. And then happened right in front of me and made me an instant CFL fan. And it was a, back in those days. It was it was a recorder for years as a as a as a punt return, but only because punt returns and field miss field goals were had the same rules. You could not block for the player. It was one against twelve, right? Wow. So it was actually a missed field goal, and uh, somebody took it. I want to say Claire Axelby or somebody like that. One of those Argos that played for twenty years on the one side of the end zone and threw it right across the other side, two yards from the end, to a guy named Dave Mann, whose nickname was Superman, who played for the Chicago Cardinals and been an all-star football player in the NFL and had come up to play for the Argos because, believe it or not, they paid more. So he gets the ball and runs straight down the sideline, and we've got seats on the fourth row, and he runs right by me, and he goes 137 yards for the touchdown. That record can never be broken because the end zones were 25 yards deep then. They're down 20. So the most that you can go for a uh, touchdown on was 130 yards, and he ran 135 or 4 or, or whatever it is. So it, it will always stand as the record. Instant fan right away. 
And, and uh, from that point on, I followed it, wanted to play in the CFL, and then God's practical joke got in the way, made you 5'6". <laughs> so, so uh, you know, then, you know, isn't that funny? And then, and then keep shrinking you for the rest of your life. That's the other part of the joke, right? So, well, uh, so I always thought that, yeah, that that uh, if I ever got in the Hall of Fame, it would be as a player. Well, I never got a sniff. You know, I called the Argos during my high school years, and I played for their. In those times, they had farm teams, right? And I played for. For the the, the the ORFU, you were owned by your local team, the, your rights. And then there was also senior ORFU, which was semi-pro. And I played for them in the last two or three years in the early 70s. But by ironically, or for ironically, the team, London Lords, whose players were owned territorially by the Tiger Cats. Now, I didn't have a sniff. Lots of people did. Lots of people off our team. I think 15 guys on our team played in the, uh, in the uh, CFL. So I saw them going up. To, towards the CFL or coming de- back down from it, one one of whom made the, the Hall of Fame, the, the late Glenn Weir. So so uh, all there's quite a connection there between myself and this league, the CFL. Well, I'm just going to go grab a coffee, Steve. You continue on. No, I'm just... oh, sorry, yeah, I do this. Yeah, <laughs> hey, this... great story, and yeah. you're you're great employee of the long. month. <laughs> yeah. After that, if that's the sort of information that people are going to get, uh, whether they're reading, listening, watching you, that, that is some f- fantastic historical stuff. Well, you try to throw, I think one thing I've always tried to do is pack, pack things in. So, you know, you waste words for style. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I don't go for the style points. I do. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm a writer more than a reporter, believe it or not, believe it or not. And, 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 and you go for style points. Part of that's humor. Part of it is expression. Part of it is, is uh, unusual comparisons. But part of it is packing information into, into very short little bits that come as part of something else. And so it's a fuller feel. That, that's how I like to write. I don't always succeed. I don't always succeed. And sometimes I go on and on and on, like I am, I am now. But, 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 uh, but I think you're right. I think you, the, the idea is to get more... The more you know, the more you want to know, and the more you feel you know the people that you care about. And that's the one beautiful thing. You've been in sports all your life. I've been in sports all my life. When you get to pro sports, there's a, it's an interesting concept because your labor force is also the product. And that doesn't exist, except a, like theater and movies maybe are the other, are the other places that that exist. And it's yeah. a really interesting dynamic. And, and once you understand that there is that dynamic, then when you explore it, it's amazing what comes out and who you get to know and what you get to know, especially in this league, because particularly the American players, most of those players have been rejected in one form or the other, or in many forms and many others by the time they get up here. So there's very interesting stories there. Some of it's just based on body size, right? You're too small yeah. to play. You're too, yeah, you're too, too small to play linebacker, too big to play free safety, something like that. Yeah, well, along those lines, uh, uh, just a quick story about Tyreek McAllister yes, last year who came on and w- was fantastic for the Tiger Cats, but I had a conversation with him and he said his agent said, hey, we need some some more relevant recent tape on you, uh, video on you, I probably don't use tape anymore, digital video on you and and we got to get it get it out, so... He said the the CFL was was my opportunity to get that, and did he ever? Because we're probably going to see him in the NFL next year. Well, I think we are, especially now that they've changed the rules. At first, I thought we would see him back here, uh, partly because he didn't get as much money to sign as one would expect. And when that happens, then you're a little bit farther down that that list. But once they changed the return rules recently, and they I think they were just approved, weren't they? The return rules in the NFL. I believe they were, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So to so it's going to change the roster makeups and and in in favor of a guy like him. Yeah, he gambled on himself. I remember that. It was it the uh when he got the touchdown. He made the team in in the exhibition game even though I think he hit, he wasn't actually on the roster for a while by what he did against uh, the Argos, I think, when he ran one back, and then all, uh, at one point, and so did uh, uh, no, it wasn't. The, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, was that was Gallimore. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Gallimore did it too. In yeah, the preseason. And, um, in the preseason, McAllister was, I think, called, four games in. Four games in. Yeah. So, so uh, you, you, they, it, it was a gamble that paid off for him, and it's another sign of something that's happened here. That this is a thing that that. You'd only recognize this if you were a longtime fan, I think, and and and, a, and 
sort of an inside football fan, the history of returners here. Yeah. It, it's it's spectacular. I can th- I can't remember all of the names, but I can think of three or four instances in the last 15, 20 years where a returner has come in as a replacement for somebody, scored a touchdown on a return, and not got the nod the next week because the other person came back. Right? Yeah. Now that was McAllister's case. It didn't, you know, he got the job and kept the job. Uh, but some of them, and then the, some of them went, went on to, to uh, do good things elsewhere. But it's just phenomenal. The number of, I, I think in, in the Jeff Reinbold era, there were something like nine different players that, that, that took it to the house on a return. They either punched yeah. this field goal or, and, 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 you know, plus, and that, that's just counting speedy once. You know, not, not 15 times or how many, however, you know, however many times he did it. So, yeah, well, you've got uh, half a century in sports. I've got almost 30 yeah. years uh, right. working Ooh, uh, in, in this role. A <laughs> uh, couple of vets chatting yeah, here, couple, Steve. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, but you talked about you being a writer. You, you've written a ton of books. You just haven't been writing in the newspaper. How many books have you written? Uh, authored or co-authored, uh, 25, I think. Wow. Uh, I mean, a b- good chunk of those, 13, I think, on figure skating. Uh, and surprisingly, just the one on football, and that would be Angelo Mosca's autobiography, which if you haven't read it, it's quite interesting. And when a- Angelo said, boy, I got a story for you, and I've got the title for you, and that kind of thing, I, you know, I'd written a lot of books. And then I said, oh, yeah, okay, Ange, sure. And then he tells me his story. And I, I, I actually, I can, I'll never forget it. We were, we were sitting in his, in, in his beautiful home, his and Helen's beautiful home on, on the lake or on the canal and, and uh, down by Welland and, and, or by uh, St. Catharines. And, and uh, he told me there was these high slippery bar stools that were sitting at his table. He, he liked, you know, he's a big guy, so he didn't want to have to sink down in a little chair. So we sat on those. And as he told me the story right off the top, I remember going limp and slipping and, uh, and sliding right off the chair. Like he caught me by surprise by, and, and what I'm referring to, of course, is his race. And that's how he started talking. He said, you don't know this. Most people don't know this, but I am technically black. And, and, uh, and, and then he said, now look at my face knowing that. And you go, whoa, you know? And, and that whole story and about the anger of the household he grew up, it was, and, and, the anger that, 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 that came in him, it explained so much about what he did, but also remorse and, and incredible remorse and wanting to change himself. It was a spectacular experience doing that book. Probably right there, my number one or two experiences in all those books, writing books, was that one. Because wow. It. And at the same time, I'm writing the autobiography of, or as told to, uh, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moore, which is figure skating. Yeah. All this gentility and you're on all the time and all these, <laughs> you know, and then, so I've got, one day I'm listening to him and when you do a book and you've recorded somebody, that's all you hear is that person's voice. It's because you've got these earphones on and you're listening to 20 hours, 30, 50, 80, 100 hours of tape. And you really get the rhythm and the time. And, and then I'm switching over the next day to do Tessa and Scott. It was quite, quite something. So, yeah, it's been uh, books are, are uh, I never considered them. It's not a big thrill for me, particularly to see my name on a byline or something. It's always nice the first time a book comes out, see what they did with the cover, how the name. Yeah, maybe you're interested in how it sells. But generally, as I always explained it, RJ, was that uh, unless you really hit a gold mine, um, Books for me were well. I need, I need a new roof on the cottage, or I need drywall on the cottage, or <laughs> or that kind of thing. And and okay, I better I better take this book, even though I I don't have a lot of time for it. I plan to do some more. There's a few books there, maybe a greatest hits column, one of those things. Because over 50 years, and and I don't know how many. What I say, 13 million words in print. Uh, Who counted and, that? I did an estimate on it. I did an estimate on it. Yeah, given and that includes a whole bunch of things. Like that included uh, working back at Sportsnet, for instance, and I was their first general columnist when when they decided to have a website. And it, it uh, worked for Sporting News on 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 their website. And for two years, RJ, I was writing for Sporting News and then CTV Sports, 
uh, in figure skating on uh, their live website. And I did that for two years before I even saw the web. I didn't even know what it was. I used to be like one of those people that called it the, the you know, the web net. You know, I didn't even know what it was called because I, I had no access to it, you know, at, at yeah. that time. But, but they were ahead of the game. Both of those organizations were ahead of the game. So I, I did some stuff for them. So uh, when you count all of those types of things, it's, it's a lot of words. And so the idea would be to, here's, here's our times through the view of somebody that was at these things through 50 years, right? Like uh, written, like go over the columns and then, then write the, a little entry and an exit on it. Here's what, here's what the times were at this time. Here's how this one was dated. Oh, here's one where I really blew it, you know, <laughs> where I said, uh, I remember one we're running Tim Thomas out of town. And, and the only other player I probably encouraged to get out of town was Anthony Calville. And they're both, I mean, one went on a, a year later to win the, the uh, Vezina Trophy and the Stanley Cup. One made the Hall of Fame and holds all of the records. Okay, so, but Steve Milton decided they shouldn't be in this town. So but, that's the key. That's get on key, somebody's guess, back yeah, if they're struggling. If they're struggling, yeah, like <laughs> uh, like get me to write about you and and, and write negative. But, but rarely do I do that. I very rarely have done anything as negative as those two guys. And look at how those two turned out. You know, so I mean, well, terrifically. I mean, they both should be very proud of their careers. Yes, uh, this is uh, of course Steve Milton. I, I think most everybody has, knows Steve, whether you've seen him, heard him, or. Read well, some of his me. books <laughs> or articles. Uh, I'm R.J. Bride. Great to have you with us on this special presentation. I, I have to tell a story about you, Steve. You probably don't remember this, but when I first came to Toronto to work in sports, I was early 20s, just out of Saskatchewan, didn't know anyone. I'm at a Leafs practice. We're, we're getting ready for scrums, and, and nobody knows me. You came over, you introduced yourself, you, you told me about you, and if I had any questions, hey, welcome, and and it took Damian Cox 10 years to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that because Damian and I are friends now. But, yeah, he did, the uh, Red Fisher, he did the Red Fisher thing on you. I don't talk to rookies, right? Red Fisher, exactly. writer in Montreal, yeah. So, But it, it was a little thing at, in that time that, that meant a lot to me, and you, I'm sure you don't even remember, but it, it stuck with me, and you've probably done that to... to dozens of, of well, young reporters and young people and, in the business over the years. I certainly remember your first year there. I don't remember that particular incident, and, I, and I'm glad I didn't embarrass myself with you. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, no, I, and you know what it's like trying to, you know, and, and if anybody out there is in sports journalism or any kind of journalism, any business at all, pay it forward. Yeah. Pay it forward. You know, I mean, that's the deal. I mean, it wasn't. You know, I'm sure you've paid it forward, that little thing. I'm sure you've done the same thing a million times since, and people did it for me when I was there. I mean, you, you come out of a little town like Aurelia, you know, where they're still riding horses, and and, and, uh, and you come suddenly, you're on the... I mean, I've been on the world scene through figure skating in the Olympics for years before before I came down here, but, you know, it was a pretty... You got thrown in that pretty quickly to get thrown into the Blue Jays and then the Leafs right away. Uh, yeah. And, and luckily, I... Um, because of the history I have in sports, dating back to the world's greatest, at least the best job in the history of Canadian teenage boys. I had it, and I had it for three years. And it goes back to then, you know. So I wasn't really, uh, and I'll tell you about it in a minute if you, if you care to hear it. But, but it, Absolutely. Uh, I wasn't overwhelmed by professional athletes because of the history I'd had with them. And, uh, but still, it's a bit, I mean, suddenly... Everybody cares. I mean, in those years, everybody cared about the Blue Jays. I mean, it was, you know, I was with them in their biggest 10 years. In fact, I've said to them, you know, in the 10 years I was there, I think you were eliminated from the playoffs. The earliest you were eliminated from postseason contention was six days before the end of the season. And you went wow. to four, you won four, you went to four uh, league finals and two World Series, which you won. I said, you should be hiring me. Just to go, <laughs> because you take a look at that those that that era when I was there ten years, they haven't had a ten years like that since, not even remotely close to it. And you know, um, however you work it, they just you know they haven't won that many champ you know that many uh, well they haven't won any pennants since then. So when I was seventeen, I was playing football, thinking I was going to be a football guy. And my football coach also worked at a hockey school. 
and this is 1966, the summer of 66, I'm 17. And all of the Leafs, five, seven of the Leafs are working there. Remember what 66, 60, the summer of 66 was. It's the last summer before their last championship, right? So yep. I'm working there in the summer of 66, 67, and 68. So that included their last championship. And five or six of the Leafs are working there, Frank Mahovlich. My, like on one side of me was Frank Mahovlich, and one was... The other side was Eddie Shack and Kent Douglas, and a bunch of guys were there. And late in the season, all of the Leafs would start. It wasn't like today where everybody's in shape for 12 hour or 12 months a year. They would play themselves <laughs> into some kind of form so training camp didn't kill them. But they wouldn't yeah. be ready for training camp. So they would come to Tam uh this hockey school, which was the biggest in the world at the time. It's where power skating was invented by the figure skaters who worked there. And the figure skaters had a rink there, and all of Canada's top figure skaters were, in the, were at that rink uh, during the summertime. So that's where I learned figure skating in 1966. But back to the Leafs, I would work with all of those guys and found out some guys were great, some just like the rest of us. They are just <laughs> like the rest of us, these professional players. And, and it was, we, not only did we have the figure skating there, all of whom happened to be 17-year-old girls, which was fabulous for me. There was a swimming pool there because it was in Scarborough. So it was open every afternoon. And most of the people that went there were my age and, and uh, that kind of thing. There was a bowling alley. Play all the golf you wanted. Play hockey. Like every Saturday night, we played hockey. And I remember one time uh, the aforementioned where, where I was saying that the, the Leafs would come out, all the guys that even that didn't work there would come out and train mad or play these games madly on Fridays and Saturday nights to get in shape for training camp in Peterborough. And I, I, you know, they let me play. So, because they were short. And so I'd be out there. I remember one night, Peter Mahovlich, who still is a close friend of mine because he's my age, and Frank Mahovlich are coming down two on one on me. <laughs> and I just stopped. I said, this is absurd. You know, and I'd skate it off. I said, this is absurd. But so, <laughs> so the point there being, I wasn't overwhelmed by the presence of really high-end talent, people that you'd grown up idolizing, which I did with Frank Mahal, which is still probably my top three favorite athletes of all time. Mm -hmm. You could look us up, by the way. Um, the Babe Ruth curse, everybody knows about that when they traded him to New York because they needed the money, no known, so they could produce the uh, play, no known in that. It's uh, um, they traded from Boston to New York yep. uh, right after they'd won the World Series. Um, Frank Mahovich was a key, key, key player for the... It was the best scorer they'd had <clears throat> probably since Charlie Conacher, so 45 years. It, like, he sometimes had double the goals th that the next player on the Leafs had. And yep. he had a spectacular Stanley Cup that year. And the next year, they traded him. Traded him to... to, to Detroit, where he stayed a couple of years, got 49 goals, I think, one year, and then to Montreal. So essentially, he eventually got traded, you know, it was really traded to their biggest rival. They haven't won since. That is the huh. curse. The real curse on the Maple Leafs is the Frank Mahovlich trade. And you could look this up, and I cannot be talked out of it. So, <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> I mean, you, I don't know how we ended up on something. that. But yeah. 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 But, <laughs> That, that's what's great about you, Steve. You're a fantastic storyteller, and these stories pop into your head. One thing you're going to have to do, though, if you're on yeah. on the broadcast, you're going to have to hit some time, so you're going to see this one. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've, I've always studiously ignored that, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll do my very best because, well, you're professional. You'll get, you'll get, you'll get me. You'll get me. Yeah, uh, I'll just say, right Steve, stop. We got to go. Stop, stop now. Yeah, and, and don't be afraid to say that. You know, we're tired of you talking. You know, so. <laughs> well, we're not. We're definitely not tired of you talking. No. We're excited to to see everything and 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 hear everything you're going to be doing. Do you have kind of a a schedule yet, or is that still to no, be determined? No, I think we're. I think we're proceeding. Um, this, you know, lots of things. I think we have to all remember. And I wrote about this in my farewell column at the Spectator about, or maybe it was the farewell to the Great Cup. I think it might have been in that part where. Most people outside of, of the Tiger Cats and those that are close watchers of them, which I have been for a long, long time, don't realize how much the people here, and it wasn't a huge staff, did in the last three years with two home gray cups, with the outdoor game, which was essentially theirs, with the, with the hockey, with, with the, the soccer, 
uh, and all those international soccer games in their uh, Champions League, playing soccer in the wintertime, um, a couple of other big, big events, Arkells, all of those kinds of things, which, which was all under their purview. And, and definitely the citywide Grey Cup thing, that, that was theirs. They basically did it. And, and even though CFL ostensibly ran it three years ago, it was the Ticats basically engineering everything. They had to, I mean, and that basically just ended in, in, in uh, December, right? So, so they, they had a lot to sort of get over and, and, and reestablish and, and, and rest from. Uh, and and sort of recalibrate for because the, the next three years aren't going to look quite that. There's not going to be two great cups here in the next three years as there as there right. were in the last three years. So uh, um, it, it it it's not going to look like that. So it took a while to figure out where to go and what to do. And so we just decided on on the general concept recently, just a few days ago. Uh, that's why I've been so quiet ab about things. I didn't want to mention anything to anybody that this may or may not happen. I didn't want to put the possibility out there uh, in case it didn't. And, and, and so that's why we haven't nailed down everything. But you can bet that I'll be a lot on TICAD audio with you and, and with, with, with others. Uh, I'll be doing um, notebooks. Uh, that's one of the journalistic um, mainstream uh, heritage journalistic things we're going to be bringing uh, to the site is is a notebook type of thing, both oral and and uh, in print, uh, tying a lot well, of things together. It, explain that, Steve, for maybe well, some people who are, don't know. Are, are types of things where you might have seven or eight. Let's let's say it's I'm at a tie cat practice during training camp. That's where it'll happen the most because there are so many things going on there, and uh, you might have eight different. Um, four paragraph like now we're talking about the print part here the four paragraphs or three paragraphs of saying hey uh so and so is looking really really good and did you know that he played for um he played uh his college ball at uh north texas state where former ticat quarterback dane evans coached in the pandemic year the, the, those little connection type things and and those things lead to more type things and this player looks good and uh he may be, you know, like, and, and then you, you segment them into, so you've heard about this player a little bit. Now here's a little more about this player. Uh, and then I will take those and that notebook and also do a, a, an audio broadcast and, and make perhaps a visual podcast. I think slightly different with a lot of the same information. Uh, and that will be done, of course, uh, vocally. And, uh, that's what the uh, notebooks are really good that way because you, there are a lot of things that you can't blow into a full column. You should just write. We, notebooks were a very, very big thing of my last several years in mainstream media because it was a way of getting uh, things that weren't being covered uh, enough. Uh, you get them in a, a, a day or two later and, and, then, and then upgrade them on a timeline too. Here, here, remember when they signed this guy three or four weeks ago? Well, here's some things that have happened to him in those three or four weeks. Those kinds of things. Now that's little just snippets. Another, little snippets. And almost like social media. Almost like social media. Very similar. Very similar. Things that uh, Cam Cole uh, was one of the great colonists of my time in this country, probably the best uh, in his era. Used to have things that made, he used to call those types of things things that may grow up into columns one day, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Yeah. But they're not necessarily a column right now, but they're worth mentioning and they help. Again, this all comes back to storytelling and storytelling, part of it is repetition. I don't mean necessarily, the key facts you'll always repeat. That's what storytelling is. That's what the oral tradition is. And the oral tradition uh, and visual tradition is, is a big part of, of what, we're, what we do here, particularly on, on the audio network. Um, repetition is a big part of that, but so is coming back to the same thing and adding little bits to stuff about somebody you already know. And pretty soon, in your mind, without you even knowing it, you have a larger portfolio of, let's say, whoever the right tackle is this year. Because now you've mentioned them seven or eight different times over, over the last three months in different contexts. All right. So uh, that, that's what, what Notebook is. There'll be other things that, uh, you know, we'll be doing uh, interviews, like specific interviews and, and, and a lot of concept pieces, too. You know, there'll be uh, uh, I'll point you to one. And this, this is a little bit off. It, we won't get to this for a little while. But I was walking through the kitchen during before the Grey Cup and I got talking to the chefs and, and the head chef. And we got talking about a lot of different things. And I said, I noticed that you feed the Thai cats 
and the forge every day, right? I mean, they get they get a meal. It's part of the. It's part of, you know, they're both have heavy salary cap leagues, so those are actually part of the salary cap. They, you know, the the, the things you spend there. I said, I, I said, are they all the same? Uh, well, that just set him like that. He went, holy <laughs> smokes! And and he started talking. So we'll bring the nutritionist in too. There is an incredible difference by people living in the same building, dressing, what, 50 feet apart in, in their dressing room, both high caliber teams, always challenging for, for playoffs and championships, total difference in, in the kind of things that they have to, the, the, the diets that they have to have, what they need to eat. In football, it's essentially about calories. It's about feeding this incredible energy that, and, and physical weight and types of things that need to be maintained where in soccer it's much more it's much more uh endurance uh, yeah endurance and and the food shows that you know and uh, different types of flexible i mean obviously both sports have to be flexible but th th there's a very like the nutrition value and the fact that one is about calories and one is about about uh and I wouldn't say nutrition because they're both very nutritious. So we're going to do something on that and, and uh, yeah. on all the platforms. And those are the kinds of things that you just you learn a little more. If you learn a little more about Tim Horton's field, you, le you learn a little more about the tie cats and the porridge. You know, I mean, I would never have guessed that there was such like the, the chef just jumped on it right. So he said, it's totally <laughs> different. And that caught me by surprise. Those little things, if you go around and you just talk to people, you find stuff. You find those little little things, and and that's what again what storytelling. And I got to keep coming back to that phrase because that's what we do, and and the more of it we do, the better we get at it. And and uh, I hope we get better at it. If we don't, we're really in trouble. So, <laughs> so. well, that's the nutrition uh, is something. After you say it, it makes a lot of sense. It does, you know. Like, and I, and it was I wouldn't like, have thought like, of oh, it. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, dumb. Yeah, it's, that's that's uh, what do they call that in fiction? When, when that something like that happens, they call it the shock of recognition. It's something okay. you always knew but you didn't know. See? You know what I mean? Like and, and the as intelligence soon as you see of it, Steve you go, Milton. Oh, you know, like it comes out of you. You know, so that's <laughs> that's uh, that's that's what we're we're looking. And it's stuff. And 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 people who are 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 uh, listening here, uh, maybe we should encourage them, RJ, to to get a hold of either of us if they've got ideas that uh, that things. True. That, hey, I never knew. Can you tell me why this or that? Like Forge, for instance, we're going to do a piece on the different soccer balls. Uh, that there's a different soccer ball used for CPL and uh, uh, Canadian Championship than there is for, say, CONCACAF, and the ball acts differently. And oh, wow. We can pull up film to show you exactly how it acts differently. So if they get back to CONCACAF and we see it again, we're going to do something on it. Who would have thought of that? Now, soccer people know that. Inside soccer people go, of course, well, that's the thing. That's the good thing about being a bit of an outsider. Like we're both, we're not total insiders on this, right? We're observers, maybe inside. Yeah. Maybe we have a little, lot more access than most people will have observing. But to us, it's not, of course, the ball is different. Like that's, a, that's an interesting thing, right? There was a goal scored. I think, I forget who got it. It, uh, it was in one of the CONCACAF games here where the ball just went, straight down and 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 fool fool the goalie because because that's the way that ball acts you know wow so i know not say eh? yeah and then if you see enough of those things anyways if there's things like that 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 our viewers uh, or readers uh happen to see and and they wonder why ask us those questions like our, our emails are all over the place right so if, if it's easy to get a hold of us say just write in and, and, and pan in and say, hey, could you guys find out why this or that? And we'll get to it. We may not, and that's a good thing, like in a notebook, hey, uh, reader Bob, Bob Jones, uh, or reader Clara Smith has, has asked us what, hey, well, here's what we found out. You know, those yeah. are the other kinds of things you can do. I mean, who knows how much of this we'll get to, but we want to. We definitely want to. Definitely. I know the feeling, as do you, when, when you come across a story that isn't out there and you're able to tell that story. A little one last year is, is James Butler, and he said he choreographs two touchdown celebrations per game, 
and then we'll freelance. If he winds up getting more, he'll freelance it. But he's he's always got two in his back pocket. He's always studying. Guys are giving him little ideas. So it, it was just kind of fun to talk about in the broadcasts. If James Butler, you know, the Tiger Cats are on the one, you know, we might be seeing a, a choreographed celebration. Then it turned into something that, that Luke and I uh, could could describe to the to the listeners. And how much better does that make your broadcast? Yeah, absolutely. Tremendously. Way better. Most of those little polishes, you know, like it's like polishing the genie's lamp, you know, like it just gives you that little, you know, poof, out comes the genie, you know, like, yeah. a, and, 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 and I will say to people, uh, RJ's downplaying himself on this, that it takes work to come up with those things. First of all, you got to notice them. Second of all, you got to have the relationship with the people. So they tell you and trust you that, Hey, he's not going to screw up this story. You know, yes. I, I'm going to tell him because I trust him. So now I wasn't there when you were told that story, uh, but I know how the process works and that's exactly the way it works. So, so um, that, that speaks to your unearthing of things. And, and you might've heard him say something and you could have easily just passed on it and just said, Oh yeah, that's interesting. And, but you went and got more, yeah. you know, and well, it just I, gave you that extra couple of minutes of great uh, I Contact. always try to put myself in, in I'm, I'm still a fan, right. even though I'm a broadcaster, and so what do I want to know? And if I'm at a game, or I'm watching a game, or I'm listening to a game, and I know if James Butler gets a touchdown, he's going to do some sort of performance, and you know, you kind of got to guess what it is, um, it's kind of exciting. It you is. Know, now you're going to watch for it. That's right, and, and, and you may never get to use it. Right. Uh, I got actually a pretty good story on that one. Um, the the uh, Tom Cheek when that Toronto the, the blue uh, Tom Cheek for those of you that are too young to remember was the legendary voice of, of uh, I can't hear Blue Jays baseball without thinking about Tom Cheek. Uh, yeah, go to Rogers Center, like, you'll see his yeah, name his on the, there, the Wall of game, Honor. All those games in a row, four thousand, five thousand, or whatever it was. So in 1992, the Jays won the World Series on the road, and that meant that. They didn't have last at bats. Atlanta did. And so he kind of, it was going to be a big, big moment. And I can still see Mike Timlin taking his time, almost throwing the ball to first base, Joe Carter catching it and jumping up and down. And Tom Cheek, I'm there, so I don't hear the broadcast. But Tom and I are, were close friends, and he lamented to me for several times over the next year he said I can't believe it a momentous occasion like that and I didn't have something prepared I did not have that little I mean you know it's that they were going to win the World Series and this big thing and I didn't have anything you know he had a good he had a good call but he said I didn't have that memorable call next year they're the home team and they're down and Joe Carter hits the thing he had no chance to prepare for that. Zero chance. And he comes up with probably the second most iconic call in the Canadian, in the history of Canadian sports. Number one being Henderson has scored for Canada. Number two yep. being touch them all, Joe. You'll never You'll hit, never a hit another, a bigger home run than that. I get a chill thinking about that. You know, like, yeah. so that's the reverse of doing the homework and, the, and being prepared and all of those kinds of things. You've also got to have that spontaneity to be able to handle something you're not expecting. Nobody expected Joe Carter, particularly to hit it down in a way slider. So, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, it's so true. It's uh, that, that's the beauty of, of this sport. And we try to put uh, pictures and insight to the, the readers, viewers, and listeners. And, and you're the, the perfect guy, guy to do it, Steve. Well, the longer we go on, and maybe I'll ask you this. Um, how long have you been with this company now? Three years? Uh, 2021. So this will be year four. Fourth, year four. Right. So are there, are there highlights from what you've seen on this team? Is there, is there three or four that you can go, wow, I'll never forget that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there are. There, uh, it's almost more accomplishments. Right. Um, because there know, was a lot of that. There was a lot of accumulated accomplishments in, in those yes. last three or four years. Yes. Yeah. Like I go back to the East final in, in 2021 and the second half against the Argos, it, it kind of looked bleak at, at halftime and it was just a, an amazing, everything came together in the second half 
and making it to the Grey Cup was uh, was and pretty exciting. In the second half. Yeah, you yeah. Went, it w- after a horrible first set, and remember, remember the play that turned that game around. Dane stripped the ball. He That's threw an right. Interception, and he and, and right near the yes. end of the first half, he took the ball away. If the Argos score, then Ticats aren't going to the Grey Cup. Yep. It's they're too far behind in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah, a great so, memory. Yeah. yeah, and I know you have a, a great relationship with Simone Lawrence, and he's an ambassador now. I'm going to miss him on the field for sure, but uh, getting to know him has been, been great. Uh, it was a big deal last year when, when Bo Levi Mitchell came in. He's going to be a yeah. Hall of Famer, and I have to be honest, I'm pretty excited to, to see him this year. I, I haven't talked to Bo, so this isn't inside information, but it's just, you know, 30 years of, of covering sports. I feel like he's going to be a, a very motivated quarterback, and and I'm excited to see what he can do this year. What are your thoughts? I, I feel the same way. In fact, I'm just looking out over the window here because I thought I might see Bo go into the field. He's been here at the stadium this week throwing practice, and I missed him every time. I just want to say hi. I haven't seen him all winter. I've been kind of laying low when it comes to that. I don't want players to say, what are you doing around here? Um, <laughs> because then, you know, I either have to lie or, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm going to give let the cat out of the bag. But cat's out of the bag now. So, yes. um, yeah, I think that's interesting. And to have a backup that, that has shown that he can come in and do some stuff, a young backup, I, I think with Taylor in there, that's, that's a really interesting thing. And all of the new guys that they signed, I mean, it's a different looking team, but kind of the same team too, you know, and, and with Scott having a training camp to go here, I think the most, I think he felt he was up to maybe 30, 40% of the offense he would have liked to put in by the end of the year. Uh, but part of that was, you know, you couldn't develop it because they were in such desperate straits to win enough games to make the playoffs that, uh, you know, they, they, that he never got a chance to put a lot of that stuff in. So that whole off, having the whole off season with 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 uh, 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 Bo and and having had Bo play for him, he's got a lot. There's a bigger head start here now. I'm I'm really interested in to see where that offense starts in training camp because. I mean, last year that offense was supposed to carry till the defense got itself together. That's the feeling I had. I'm feeling the same this year, right? They, you know, they've they've strengthened and changed the way they're de- doing defense. They've changed the defense quite a bit, so it might take mm-hmm. a little time for that to catch up. Generally, defenses are supposed to be ahead of offenses early, but I'm not sure that's the the case here this year. I think that uh, these guys. I want to see how much they hit the ground running. Now they got to figure out a bunch of things. Like they've got way too many receivers. I mean, and I don't mean in numbers. I'm talking about good receivers, people that can yeah. play, that have proven they can play in this league or sure look like they can. So that's going to be interesting there. But, the, you know, the middle of the line set, it looks like they're pretty well set to tackle. There's obviously set at running back. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, if, they, if they go to tight end. If they, you know, that's going to be an interesting one too because ratios. Uh, and we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll do some explaining on all the sites, uh, a little more detail on the ratio because the way – the ratio things have changed, and it's very confusing for a lot of people about the designated Americans. So we'll try and find a simple way to do that, and I think we may have to do that through graphs and all of those other visuals. You got a great, great support tech tech group here, They're really good at that stuff. I'm not going to touch. I'm just going to say, can you do this kind of thing and get that up there, and we we can talk about it. You and I or who, whoever uh, can talk about it. But it, but it it changes. It looks to me, particularly with a Canadian middle linebacker, that. There's some racial flexibility, what you want in this league. You definitely want it. You want it. And, and also the kind of players they've, even the new ones they brought in, a lot of them can, can be what they quote, quote, unquote, called designated Americans because they've been in the league long enough that they can replace a Canadian during the game if they have to, right? You'd rather not yeah. see that happen. But, but uh, you know, does that change? But then change? there's only so many snaps they can play, and it, only, it is only, complicated. It is very complicated. And... That's what we got to do. I mean, that's what journalists do, not just sports journalists do. We take con, we, we should, when we're at our best, we take complicated situations and explain them. So the average person, and I don't mean to use the word average as a, that's probably the wrong word because I hate average. But but the, but yeah. so that, that someone that, who's maybe not a diehard fan that follows every second. That's right. To be able to understand. explain it to them I'm, so they I'm, understand. We do that all the time. I mean, one of my favorite all-time cartoons about journalism is uh, <laughs> is uh, a guy sitting back in his chair uh, working at the New York Times with a blindfold on, and there's a dartboard up there, and instead of the numbers on the dartboard, it has concepts: sewage, politics, sports, war. And he's throwing a dart, saying, "Which thing am I an expert at today?" 
In other words, we're taking all of these complicated things. Malcolm Gladwell does this extremely well. He's probably the best who's ever been at it and boils down all these complicated principles so the regular human human beings can understand it and grasp it and go, ah, I see that now. I get it, you know, and, and it, it's taking something quite complicated so that at least it's it's manageable. You could put it in a sandwich and eat it, you know, so. <laughs> well, we're, we're getting close to an hour here, Steve. So oh, really? we okay. appreciate everybody who's who's, uh, who's hung around in? and chatted. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to do this a lot throughout the season. Sure. I, I, I know you and I are going to have a few shows and um, it'll be uh, it'll be fun. Uh, Forge fans, Ticats fans, you'll get the up to date information from the great, the Hall of Famer, Steve Melton, and of course, uh, historical information. We had some of that in this conversation, Steve. It's extremely interesting, and and it not everybody is is up to date on on all the historical facts. So, with no. your experience to be able to to share it, it it's going to be great. Well, history history lives, right? And that's an important thing. We're not going to live in the past here. Believe me, that's the last thing we're going to do is live in the past. We're going to move. This is about the present, future, and a little bit of looking into the past, but the past informs us. The past is inside us, all of us, even if we weren't alive then, you know, because that's what we <laughs> build upon, right? And, and it gets us to where we are today a lot of times. So sometimes it helps to have a little uh, little context there. And, and uh, yeah, and there's a lot going on in the present, and there's an awful lot going on in this present that we're in right now. Absolutely, there is. I can't wait for the, the seasons to start, and they're right around the corner. We'll be, we'll be starting up right away, but Saturday. we'll be able to read Steve Milton's articles, to be able to see him and to be able to hear him. It's just fantastic. Welcome to the Hamilton Sports Group and, and the audio networks. And can't wait to, to read all your stuff and, and have some conversations with you, Steve. Great to have you as a teammate. Well, I, we're off to a good start, RJ. And it's great after, again, all these years to, to work with you on Encore une fois. Thanks for listening to The Forge Audio Network. Keep up to date on your Forge FC by subscribing to The Forge Audio Network on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.